I'm Tim O'Shea, I'm the principal of the university. I have tremendous uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to Barbara Webb's uh, inaugural lecture. Uh, I'm delighted uh, that her sister Rose is here, re representing the, the, fa the family interest. Uh, delighted uh, to see so many distinguished people. I've uh, got Margaret Tate from University Court, great to see you here. Uh, Jim Howe, who's, who spent so many years successfully leading the School of Artificial Intelligence. Delight delighted that you're here, Jim. But a very distinguished audience. Uh, altogether and, and very appropriate. Uh, Barbara studied psychology at the University of Sydney, uh, graduating uh, with a BSc Ons and the University Medal. Uh, she got her PhD in artificial intelligence here and then uh, she lectured in the psychology departments um, uh, at, here at Edinburgh, at Nottingham and at Stirling and then came, uh, joined the school as a reader in 2003 and became professor of biorobotics in um, 2010. Immensely successful, a fabulous set of publications uh, because they do look like the sort of publications that you would like a professor of biorobotics to have with the publications in Nature, Journal of Experimental Biology, uh, Royal Society B, Biological Society Proceedings, Journal of Comparative Neurophysiology, as well as uh, the more boring journals that a lot of you publish in. Um, so very, very good. Um, her research is in the perceptual, uh, in perceptual systems for the control of behavior, uh, building computational and physical models. Um, and for those of you who aren't artificial intelligence people, that might sound boring, but it isn't because she focuses on insect behaviors. So that means you get things that jump about and do, do um, interesting things. And she's recently uh, focused on uh, some of the more complex capabilities of insects including uh, multimodal integration, navigation, uh, and uh, learning. Um, she uh, says on her website that she's been bugged about insects throughout her uh, research career, and as well as being an excellent model for exploring the essentials of robot control systems, um, they're also a good source of entertainment. And if you do visit the robotics uh, part here, um, one certainly notices that. Um, and Barbara also says on her website that robotics is her day job. In real life, she's Kate Webb, a uh, musician in a group, uh, Gator, which specializes in European court and popular medieval music in appropriate costumes and settings. And she specializes in, the sh in shawms, <coughs> shawms, an ancestor of the oboe. But, he but here she's dressed in the appropriate garb uh, for a professor of biorobotics in the School of I Informatics, uh, giving an inaugural lecture which is entitled Robotic Perspectives on Biological Substance. Bob. So thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak on this occasion and thank you all for turning up on this cold, dark night to see me talk, so I hope it will be sufficiently entertaining and not too long. Uh, so what do I mean by robotic perspectives? Um, the, the basic perspective really is that we just like, as robotics engineers, we'd like to build machines that act intelligently in the world. And as we know, biology has often been an inspiration for machines that people build. And I just took one quite non-robotic example, but I think is a nice example. Um, this is an example of the silkworm spinneret, how the silkworm produces silk by extruding um, a liquid through its silk gland extruder. And nearly all the early attempts to, to make, um, synthesize uh, cloth or fibers were actually done in exactly the same way. They were very explicitly inspired by this mechanism to try and extrude fibers in the same way, from a liquid in the same way as the silkworm. So it's, it's the idea of, of trying to look at biology and pull ideas from biology to build things has been around for a long time. But in fact, often the perspective goes the other way. So just as often, you actually find that understanding the, the engineering system, inventing some system in engineering, then actually shows light on the biological system. And this is one of my favorite examples, um, which is what's called a pressure difference receiver. Um, it's a way of hearing the direction of sound. And it was actually um, developed in the 1930s by engineers. This is a slightly later picture, but just gives the example where basically the idea is you have a microphone or a diaphragm of a microphone that has 
is poised between two different entrances so that it actually, rather than just vibrating to the sound that's arriving this way, what the vibration depends on the sound arriving by this route as well because it's operating on the other side of the same membrane. Um, and this actually means that sound, the sound acceptance will be directional um, because the phase of the sound will be different that's traveled through here versus traveled through here. And the different phase of the sound will mean that the vibration will change as well. Uh, so it's a very useful mechanism for making microphones directional. And once people had discovered this, they actually realized that nature has discovered exactly the same solution. And lots of different animals actually use it, um, frogs and birds, but in particular crickets. Um, so they have ears that are on their legs and they're connected to each ear is connected to the other ear by a kind of tracheal tube which air can flow through so that their eardrum actually vibrates not just according to how the sound hits it but also how the sound travels through the tube to the other side of the eardrum. And this makes their hearing directional which is useful for crickets as I'll explain in a moment. Okay, so that's just an example where in fact the engineering insight was important for understanding the biology. And in a kind of more general sense, really, the, the overarching aim of the work that I've been doing for the last 20 years or so um, is that we basically want to demonstrate that we've understood a biological system. And to demonstrate it, we can demonstrate that one way to demonstrate it is by building a machine that works in the same way as the biological system and seeing that it actually does what we want it to do. So this is um, the example that most of you, anyone who knows me, will probably be familiar with, that um, this is a robot that imitates cricket behavior, and I'll show a little video of that later. Um, but just to show I'm not the only one who's doing this weird thing of building robots that are like insects. There's quite a lot of people around the world who are doing it, and this is just a few other examples. Um, this is a robot that has a visual system that's based on the visual system of the locust, which is very sensitive to expansion. Um, and basically, they're testing quite detailed models of the neural processing that underlies this expansion sensitivity by building it onto a robot and seeing if it is. Um, here's an example from Japan um, where they're actually trying to see how silkworms move towards, um, sorry, silkworm moths in this case, move towards um, chemical odors. And so they actually take the antennae of the silkworm moth and they've built this robot that has exactly the same kind of layout of its antennae and can detect the chemical and then they program it to try and move in a way appropriate that they think the silkworm moth, um, moth moves. And in fact, actually, you might say, okay, but it can't fly like a moth, but actually silkworm moths that are used to produce silk are, are so, have been so inbred that they don't actually fly very much anymore either. They walk most of the time. Um, so in fact, you can imitate quite closely with a robot of the same scale the movement that this moth makes. And this is just a final fairly recent example um, where this is a little robot under here that's actually interacting with the cockroaches. And the cockroaches are trying to hide under shelters and the, the robot has been programmed with a mechanism um, to try and hide under shelters as well and also to detect how many other cockroaches are near it and to make a decision about when it's getting too crowded and when to move to another shelter. And this is Hopefully, the idea is that this actually imitates exactly how the cockroaches themselves make that decision. Um, interestingly, in this case, they actually had to cover this robot with a little piece of paper covered with cockroach extract so that it had the same chemical cues, and then the cockroaches would accept it as another cockroach and respond to its behavior the way they would to other cockroaches. Okay, so that's kind of a big, um, you know, just a, a little sample of the things people are doing, but what people normally say at this stage, if I say, you know, what do you do for a living? I say, I, I build robot crickets. Um, they, they do tend to ask, well, why and how? How did you ever come to be doing this as your, as your living? Um, so I'll try and give some sense of how and why. It may not be satisfactory, but at least may give you some clues. Um, so, okay, first diversion. How did I get here? Um, as was already mentioned, I did my undergraduate BSc degree at, at Sydney University, um, primarily in psychology, but um, the, the nature of that degree is that you actually do quite a lot of different subjects at the same time. And I, at the time, I did psychology, mathematics, and computer science, which was considered to be a completely weird combination. There wasn't a single other student doing that combination of subjects. And 
everyone I mentioned it to said, well, why, you know, no one, why would you want to do those subjects together? Which I think speaking to this audience who are familiar with AI, I mean, it seems completely obvious why this is a really good combination of subjects. But I didn't really know much about AI when I started it, so it was really perhaps fortuitous. And another nice thing about the, the degree um, that I did was in the fourth year, we did two projects. Um, so one was a practical project and one was a theoretical project. The practical project that I did um, was actually psychophysical tests of the ma ullman model of visual motion perception. So it was really classic psychology, psychophysics on vision perception. And the theoretical um, project I did was on the nature of simulation and how that impacts on the idea of strong AI, which is the idea that if you build a computer that simulates um, cognitive behavior, human-like behavior, can you say that computer really is cognizing, it really is thinking in the same way that we are thinking, or is it just a simulation? And so this is really what got me into AI, I would say. And um, I'm quite pleased to say um, that, in fact, my first publication was from my undergraduate project, um, which was some additional predictions and further tests of the Mar Ullman model of motion perception, my first and last publication in psychophysics. Um, but there were some interesting things that I think I, I gained from this whole process. Part of it was something that I hadn't really been exposed to very much in, in psychology up till then was the fact that, it, I mean, those here in AI, again, will also all know Ma as really one of the founders of kind of computational vision. Um, and the importance that you could actually formally or sp specify a hypothesis, not just have a hypothesis as most psychologists did, but actually really have a formal mathematical or computational hypothesis. And how much difference that made in terms of the preciseness of the predictions you could make and the ability to then close the loop to verify those with experiments. Um, and I also, a little bit later, actually also published the, the, res the results of my other fourth year project, um, as do computer simulations really cognize? Um, and that was my second publication, which again, I think was the only, my first and last publication in theoretical artificial intelligence, um, which kind of concerned things such as what, well, what I learned from it really is things about like what is a model? And in particular, the idea that simulation and replication are not necessarily different things, that one way to model a system is actually to physically build the system. Okay, so going on, how did I get to here? There's a bit of an interlude. I worked as an RA in econometrics and I was a full-time tutor in psychology statistics and I, as all Australians do, had to travel around Europe for a, quite a long time. Um, and while I was traveling around Europe, I found out I'd got a scholarship to Edinburgh, so I was very happy to come to Edinburgh. So I started a PhD at Edinburgh um, and I really had very vague idea of what I wanted to do Roughly, I wanted to build and test some model of some perceptual system. And soon after I got here, I, I kind of got sucked into this whole um, philosophy that was coming through at the time that really to understand intelligence, you have to understand how it's embedded in the world and embodied in the world. And so therefore, really, it would be more interesting not just to do a perceptual system, but really a sensory motor system to close the loop. So how does an input drive an output? in behavior. And preferably, I was interested in trying to do this at, at the neural level, to really get down to what is the hardware of the brain that allows this to happen. Um, and even, in fact, preferably, I, I wanted to do it with real hardware implementation as a robot. And again, this was partly the, the zeitgeist at the time, the idea that you hadn't really proved that a system could do something unless you could build it into a real robot, that a simulated robot was not a real proof of anything, and you had to deal with the real world. So all of these things basically led me to say, okay, well, what I want to do is find a simple, low-level example of a sensory motor system that I can copy at the neural level and build as real hardware. So I want something where the circuit is, is very well understood and I can just build it. And the answer was crickets. Okay, so... Um, at, up till that time, I'd had no particular affection for insects. Um, growing up in Australia is not a place which leads you to have 
you know, strong feelings towards insects. Well, you might have strong feelings, but they're usually quite negative. Um, but, you know, I, I sort of found, okay, this was a circuit that, you know, a, a system that people had done a lot of work on, and there seemed to be lots of things. So I thought, well, let's get into it. And what I found out, um, well, and have never since to be, since to be amazed by is, is just that crickets are amazing. And by extension, insects are amazing. Well, all biology is amazing. But I hope to just convince you in this next little diversion um, that crickets, at least, are amazing. OK, so the, the behavior that I was first looking at in crickets um, and that led me to do that is what's called the, the phonotaxis behavior, or basically the mating behavior of crickets. So this is um, a male cricket. In this case, it's one that actually has a burrow, and it's moving its wings, one wing across the other, to produce this calling song that looks like this. And this is a female cricket who is attracted to that calling song and finds her way there. Um, and this picture is actually from 1749, with a few little additions to sort of clarify it. But, so people have known about this behavior for a long time. And in fact, they've been really doing experiments on this behavior for, for something like 50 years. Um, recording from the neurons involved in this behavior for at least 30 years. And so it seemed like a system that, that you know, was well understood and that I could copy. Um, but of course, as always with these things, it turns out once you get into the details, it's not so clear. And indeed, when I said, OK, I'm going to build a, a robot that does the same thing, I very quickly found that a lot of the information is not fully understood. And it still isn't, um, in fact, fully understood. But Rather than go into a lot of detail about that, let me just show you a couple of the crickets robots that we built. Um, so this is one of the, the crickets robots. It has ears up here and a circuit that copies the auditory system of the cricket that I showed you earlier with the cancelling of the sound from two different um, directions. And in this case, um, the robot is programmed with a, a small neural circuit that copies what we think might be going on in the brain of the cricket. And in fact, it was able to find um, real male crickets. So these are actually <laughs> male crickets singing away, um, and the robot was able to find them. The male crickets were a bit disappointed. <laughs> okay. Um, and another robot that we built a little bit later, so this one is a sort of pseudo walking robot so that we could actually test this in a slightly more natural environment, although having said that, it's actually sterling in December, so it's not a time the crickets would go out. Um, but it could find its way to the sound over, you know, in this more natural system. And it's also a sort of pseudo walking robot as well. Okay. So we, we could build robots that could copy this behavior, but there's still lots of details of how this is done that we're still learning more about. So I wouldn't say that we've solved the problem completely. But just for the moment, I, I'm going to go on to a couple of other behaviors that the cricket also has. So this is um, another behavior that we've looked at in some detail which is called the optomotor response, which is a behavior that when the world is moving around you, um, you actually don't think it's the whole world moving. You think it's probably me moving relative to the world, and you correct for that. And this is a behavior seen in humans down to insects. Pretty much every animal has this behavior. So if you rotate this drum around the cricket, it, it will follow the rotation. However, um, what happens if you then play a sound to it? So you play a sound from one side and the drums rotating the other side and the insect has to respond to both of these. How does it integrate them? Um, and this is uh, something that we've been looking at for a while. Um, and initially people thought, well, maybe it can just add one, add the two things together and go in the average direction or maybe it just suppresses one of these behaviors and then does one of the other behaviors. Um, we've tested some of these different possibilities on, on different robots. Um, so this was one of the first ones we did, and then this is one of the more recent versions. So here, there's a camera um, that's looking up at a spherical mirror so that it's getting an almost 360-degree view of the world, which crickets have. Um, and then we're processing that to extract the visual motion and have a simple um, controller to kind of <laughs> adjust for visual motion. Um, there's an auditory circuit still on this robot, so it's the same robot that you saw earlier, basically. Um, so it can go to sound and it can react to vision, and this one's the same. In this case, it actually had an a, um, analog VLSI chip that was doing the motion perception based on 
um, some quite detailed modeling of how flies, fly motion, vision motion works. Um, and the main thing, I mean, one of the first things we found with this was that the simple idea that you just add the two together doesn't really work at all. Um, basically, because if you turn towards a sound, that gives you beautiful visual motion in the opposite direction, which means you turn away from the sound again. And it's, it's a kind of an obvious problem um, in retrospect. Um, we had to build the whole robot to figure out that it, was, it wasn't going to work that way. But what we've done quite a lot of more work on this recently and looked both at cr in cricket experiments and robot experiments. And currently, our, our hypothesis, and we, we think we've ruled out some of the simpler explanations, leaving this as, as perhaps the most likely idea, is that the cricket is actually predicting its visual feedback when it turns to sound. So when it turns to sound, it knows it's turning, and internally, it's sending a prediction to its visual system saying, ignore this amount of visual motion because that's what you expect to see. And if there's any extra visual motion, then you should react to that. That means you're, you're unsteady. Um, so this is, I mean, it's quite an old idea of, of reference copy. Um, and here the idea is, is not just that it necessarily um, does that prediction, but that in fact it can actually learn because in different visual surroundings, that visual feedback might change. So you need to actually be adaptive to how much visual feedback you might be expecting in any situation. Um, so here we have two parallel pathways, the auditory reflex and the optomotor reflex. Um, when you react to the audition, you actually send a signal to this little predictive subsystem, which is learning to make the prediction that will cancel out what's expected here. And then those finally get put together and come out. So that's, that's kind of the model we're testing. And we're also very interested in how this idea might actually map onto the brain of an insect. And again, I'm not going to go into detail of, of insect brains, but there are some parts of the insect brain that are specialized for learning and that maybe are actually well set up to do this particular kind of control. Okay, another behavior of crickets um, that's quite interesting. So this is the cricket. This is not a cricket. This is a spider that's about to attack this cricket. Um, and spiders attack crickets quite a lot. Um, they're usually not successful, and the reason they're not successful is the crickets have these appendages on the back of their um, abdomen called circe, which are covered with little hairs. So this is what it looks like under an electron microscope. You have all these hairs, and they're incredibly sensitive to any wind front, any acceleration of wind. So as the spider moves towards the cricket, it actually produces wind, and the cricket detects that, and within um, 20 or 30 milliseconds, can react and jump away and move away and escape. Um, so it's a really quite impressive sensory system. Um, and it's another one that we've, we've looked at a little bit, tried to, to build some models of. So I'm just going to show you um, this picture. This was a robot built by Tim Chapman, who is one of my first PhD students, um, where he actually built little hair sensors out of light bulb filaments. Um, and these were directional and could detect the wind um, and then um, he also put this on, again, one of these small wheeled robots um, with a very simple vision system, an eye and auditory system, and also what he calls antennae, but they were really just distance sensors. And um, for example, this meant that the, the escape response was mostly to, to um, the, sorry, yes, was mostly to wind, but also it would escape if there was a sudden loud sound. Also, it would escape if the lights came on in the same way as a cockroach does. So it had different kinds of escape responses in different sorts of circumstances. And it was also quite important that if it was escaping, how does that react with if it hits a wall, if it runs towards a wall when it's escaping, does it keep just trying to run away in that direction or does it try and integrate the two behaviors in a sensible way? So that was one reason for including the antennae. So you can see here we're trying to move towards not just having one behavioral capability, but having multiple behavioral capabilities on one robot. Um, I'll just say a little bit more about the antennae because you know, we think of antennae in insects mostly as, okay, it's just like a long stick, like a blind person's long stick that allows them to detect things from far away. Um, actually, antennae are amazing. Um, so the antennae of a cricket um, have, you know, at least 10,000, possibly more chemical sensors. Um, they have thousands of mechanosensory receptors, so all the way along every little segment of the 
antennae has a receptor for bend, but also at the base, there's several very specialized receptors for, for bend that are incredibly sensitive. They have thermoreceptors and humidity receptors. They have extremely detailed control of, these, of the motion of their antennae, so basically three degrees of freedom um, that they can move this joint in any direction that they like. Um, and they, they use them all the time as well. So they do, for example, tactile scanning and chemical sampling. They don't just passively wait for the world to run into them, but they actually scan the world um, with their sensors in a coordinated way when they're walking, for example. And if there's a visual target, they actually move their, their antennae and will track the visual target with their antennae as well. And as you'll see in a moment, they also track um, auditory targets with their antennae. So they, they seem to, you know, there's something out there in the world that they're trying to use their antennae to follow as well. Okay, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to show you on the next slide the beautiful and, you know, artificial antennae that we've built because we haven't built one yet, but I think it'd be something definitely to aim for. Um, of course, you know, so far I've been saying we've been using robots that are just wheeled models, but in fact, crickets are incredibly good at moving as well. Um, and so here's some video that's taken by a current PhD student, Georgius Petru. Um, so this is slow motion video of a cricket reacting to a sound that's coming from this side. And so you can see the antennae move towards it, even the mouth parts move towards it, the head turns towards it, there's a big bend in the body, um, and then there's this wonderful coordinated action between all these limbs, each of which has um, at least five degrees of freedom, probably more, and not even counting what the, the foot. Um, here you can see the, the Circe at the back there as well. So clearly there's, there's some fabulous complicated control going on here as well. And then it adjusts its, its heading and will then head off in the direction of the sound. Um, the next video, I'm not sure how well you'll see it, maybe once it gets started you'll see, is actually a cricket swimming. So crickets, you don't normally think of them as swimming, but actually they can swim very well. If you throw them into, um, into water, I think once it gets going you'll, you'll see it. Um, they actually do a beautiful breaststroke. So they, they change from having alternating gait of one leg on each side sort of going in turn to having their legs coordinated and their two front legs go together and their back legs kick out and they, they really do a lovely breaststroke. Um, this is a cricket that's never been in the water before and probably for generations and generations of its, this cricket hasn't been in the water but nevertheless they, they still have this wonderful swimming capacity. And of course, um, when people think of crickets, they also think of jumping. They have these huge back legs that allow them to do beautiful jumps. Um, they can climb over you know, really difficult terrain and so forth and so on. So there's all sorts of things that, that crickets can do that we haven't got robots that can do anything like this, this sort of capability. Um, and then finally, and I mean, this is not to exhaust the limits of interests of crickets, but finally, um, crickets also learn, and they learn some quite interesting and complicated things. Um, this is an experiment done by uh, Matsu, Matsumoto and Mitsunami where they're training a cricket to associate different smells, um, P and V here, and one of the smells is being paired with a nice sugar solution and the other one is being spared, paired with a nasty high salt solution. Um, however, which one is, is paired with which actually depends on whether the lights are on or the lights are off. So they have to learn not only that for example, you know, strawberry is good and lemon is bad, but they have to learn that strawberry is good in the light, but bad in the dark, and vice versa. Um, and crickets can actually learn this, this quite easily. They can learn it quite well. So they can learn not just, you know, to associate different odors with different tastes, but actually to make that association completely context dependent and dependent on a very arbitrary context of, of light and dark, because again, you can't, you know, there's no particular reason why this, they should have evolved to, to learn um, that tastes and smells are paired differently in the dark. Um, another behavior that we investigated, um, and in fact, this was first demonstrated by, by Mitsunami in cockroaches, and we looked at in crickets, uh, let me just turn that sound off, is um, 
a, a localization behavior, a place learning behavior. So those of you who are familiar with the, the Morris water maze that's used for rats, the idea is that there's, there's actually a safe place for this cricket um, around here. So the, the bottom of this arena is actually heated up, so the cricket doesn't like it very much. And there's one cool spot, but it can't find that cool spot unless it runs straight across it. Um, but once it's found it once, it actually finds it again much more quickly the next time, even though there's nothing to actually show where the cool spot is. There's no, um, th yeah, there's, there's nothing to indicate where it is apart from where it is relative to these surrounding landmarks. Um, and we can test that it is depending on these visual surrounds by, for example, rotating the visual surroundings and seeing where does it go. And it doesn't go to where the cool spot actually is, but to the place indicated by the visual surroundings. And this experiment has been used you know, for 30 years in rats to show you know, the, how good they are at place memory with their hippocampus. Um, crickets don't have a hippocampus, but they can do it pretty much as well as rats can do it. Um, the, the kind of scores we get and the, the rate at which they learn is quite comparable to rats. OK, so this is um, really sort of the, the area that we're, we're really um, researching at the moment. So we're trying to understand more about the brain circuitry that underlies learning in crickets and in other insects, and in particular other insects um, that do some interesting other behaviors, such as complex navigation behaviors in ants. OK. Um, diversion three. So there's part of what underlies you know, what we do is really the motive to create. And the history of technology has lots and lots of examples of people trying to imitate lifelike behavior, make things look alive. Um, and this is a very early example from the Greek era um, of Hel Heron of Alexandria's mobile temple, which actually, although people mostly go on about this, this top part of the temple, which involved hydraulics and so forth, actually, I think most interesting is the base, which is basically the first mobile robot. Um, and let me describe, I have a little description of what it was meant to do. So it says, um, a platform fitted with three wheels, bearing the apotheosis of Bacchus, moved by itself upon a firm horizontal and smooth surface up to a certain point, then stopped, at which moment the sacrificial flame burst forth from the altar in front of which Bacchus stood. And it goes on, all these bits happen. So suddenly festoons appeared all around the base of the platform and figures representing the Bacantes to the beating of drums and clanging of cymbals um, danced around the temple within which Bacchus was placed and so on and so on. And then finally, after all these movements had been carried out automatically, the platform returned of its own accord to its starting point. So this is a, a lovely mechanism. And um, just to describe a little bit more what happens, the base is actually driven by having a descending weight that has a, a rope around the pulley to the drive wheels. And this might seem, OK, very basic. You can just make it go forward. But in fact, as Heron describes in quite some detail, you can actually make it take all sorts of different paths. So you can have two ropes, one of which goes to each of two wheels so that you can have differential um, motion. And then, for example, if you wind the, the rope around the axle one way and then put it around the little stick and then have it wind the other way, then the wheel will go forward but then be pulled backwards. And so, for example, one wheel could be going forward, the other one starts to go backwards and the, the whole thing turns on the spot, um, will move along, and then the other one might start to go backwards and it turns. So you can actually do quite complicated paths and you kind of pre-program the path by winding these onto, you push it along the path you want to go and you wind it on as you go. Um, so it's quite a neat little system. Um, here are just a few examples from the medieval period, which is my favorite period, so I thought I'd better put them in, um, of different kinds of automata that people have built that were supposed to kind of represent um, animals again. So this was the elephant clock built by Al-Jazari. Um, so you have a little elephant here, and then you have all sorts of interesting movements that go on. Each of these animals has its own movement. Um, and a little bird pops up at the top and calls. This is a mechanical cock um, that still exists the, in a museum in Strasbourg. I mean, it was on the, it was basically famous around the world at the time. And it flaps its wings, and I think it moves its, its beak open and has several other things. So it's kind of all clockwork inside. But again, it's trying to imitate a real cock and was in, considered incredibly impressive. 
Um, this is just, I chose it because it's one of the earliest examples of an insect automata, um, which is a little spider that was actually built, sorry, it's not 1310, uh, I wish it was, it's actually 1610, I should say that. Um, but nevertheless, quite nice little thing that this is with the cover, and if you take the cover off, there's a little clockwork mechanism inside that means the little legs move along, and so on. Okay, and the development of these kinds of complex automata were what led, well, one of the reasons that Descartes actually, you know, was sufficiently impressed to suggest that he said that those with any knowledge of these man-made automata can easily conceive that animals may be just complex machines. Okay, clearly animals are more complicated, they're, they're more perfect, um, but they're not really doing anything that automata aren't doing. But I think it's worth stressing that he wasn't necessarily saying by this that animals are unfeeling, you know, you can do what you like to animals because they're just machines. He wasn't meaning just machines in that sense. Um, his point really was that up till now, people had said, you know, what makes animals do what they do is that they have some kind of immaterial soul that's the driving force that allows them to do what they do. And he was saying, well, well no, you can actually, if you look at these automata, they do all the kinds of things that animals do, but they don't have an immaterial soul. So clearly it could just be a mechanism. Um, of course, Descartes was trying to distinguish us from the animals. Um, so he, he said, you know, animals, unlike humans, can't, they lack rational capabilities and language. And he assumed that these two things, of course, could not be automated. Um, and so therefore, we are not automata. Um, so I think it's actually quite interesting looking at the current state of, of AI is that, in fact, rational capabilities and language are probably more automated, more successfully automated than the kinds of things that I've shown you that crickets can do. Okay. Um, a little bit later than uh, Descartes, there was some really amazing automata built in the 18th and 19th century, and one of the most famous is Vaucasson's duck. So this is... Um, an old photo, it no longer exists, and this photo, I think, is from the, the 1920s. Um, but you can see it's quite, quite complicated. And again, I'll give you a description of, of what it was meant to do. Um, so he said, so this is actually his, his letter describing the duck. Um, a duck wherein, yes, so the duck stretches out its neck to take corn out of your hand, it swallows it, digests it, and discharges it by the usual passage. So it actually was meant to show digestion as well. Um, and then also the duck drinks, plays in the water with its bill, makes a guggling noise like a real living duck. And in short, I have endeavored to make it imitate all the actions of the living animal, which I have considered very attentively. And he also sort of starts to describe, you know, the mechanism and the complexity of the mechanism and how perfect it is. Um, and says, for example, I don't believe the anatomists can find anything wanting in the construction of its wings. Not only every bone has been imitated, but all the eminences of each bone and so forth and so on. And he starts to get into some detail about the bones. And eventually he says, um, the inspection of the machine will better show that nature has been justly imitated than a longer detail which would only be an anatomical description of a wing. So he's saying it's, you know, I, what I've built is a wing. Okay. So it's quite amazing. Um, what's a little disappointing, perhaps, is that um, unlike a real duck, the mechanism for this duck is not inside the duck. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, the clockwork mechanism that underlies the, the control. So part of really, you know, our, our aim here is to get all of this inside the duck. That would be much more interesting. But it's still quite amazing, you know, what it could do. And it, it certainly amazed the courts of Europe. He kind of made his living going around the courts of Europe with this model. Um, he also built um, this, this model. And this is, a, again, a slightly later philosopher following Descartes, basically, who said, well, let's extend the idea you know, not just animals, but humans are also mechanisms. So, and he specifically uses Vaucasson's example. He says, Vaucasson, who needed more skill for making his flute player than for making his duck, would have needed still more to make a talking man, a mechanism no longer to be regarded as impossible. So he, see, he sees 
what Vocason is doing is really showing that this capability to build the system is, is really there. Um, and I was just going to say a little bit more about this, um, the flute player here. It's actually a pipe and tabor player. And uh, again, um, Vokasan describes how, he, how difficult it was to make this machine. Um, in particular, he says, I would have it observed that here an instrument is played upon which is very cross-grained and false in itself, that I've been forced to articulate sound by a pipe of three holes only. I, I happen to have one here. Um, so this is a, a three-hole pipe. But a three-hole pipe can actually produce more sounds than just three, three notes, um, because all the tones must be performed by greater or less force of the winds and half stopping of holes to pinch the notes. So in fact, basically by overblowing, you get the different notes. And I want to stress that Vokensson's um, mechanism here, it wasn't the case that he just had you know, a little music box here and then this thing moving. He actually was producing the wind and using also um, was actually producing the tonguing sound. So when you make the note that you have to actually touch your tongue in between, he was actually making that motion with an artificial tongue as well, um, covering the holes with the, fi with the fingers. So he was actually, this mechanism was really playing the flute. Um, and it's not just coordinating the flute. Um, you also have to actually play it with a drum at the same time. So I'll attempt to demonstrate <laughs> just how difficult it would be to, to make such a, a mechanism. Um, let's see. Um, I would like to think that's actually harder than making, you know, a speaking machine. Several of us have speaking machines now, you know, in our pockets. So um, I think it's interesting that we still don't have things that can do that sort of behavior. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I think this idea of, of mechanism is really one that I like very much. And it's become more and more put forward as a kind of philosoph philosophical view in the philosophy of science and philosophy of biology in particular. The idea that an explanation in biology is really the description of a mechanism. And by that is meant not just you know, a, a set of causal effects, but really it's some kind of actual physical system that consists of certain kinds of components. And you may further decompose those components um, and find the mechanism behind those the operations of those components and how they're organized together to interact to produce the observed phenomenon. So I think the way to sort of sum up the, the work that I do um, as biorobotics is that we just take this you know, idea of what explanation is really literally. We say, you don't just try and describe the system as a mechanism, but you actually should try and build the mechanism itself. So to my conclusions, um, you know, so this is my, my aim for the remaining remainder of my career to build the complete robot cricket. Um, and just to sort of sum up what I think the robotic perspective is actually contributing to biology here are several things. Um, one is that it really makes you consider the interaction of the physical and the computational in biological systems. And it's very easy to abstract away from those things and to think about them purely as computational systems or purely as physical systems. But what's interesting about biology and also I think interesting about robotics is that you're trying to solve both these problems at the same time. Um, the second thing is that you should be trying to understand complete behavioral loops, not just understand visual processing, for example, and stop when you have some kind of internal representation, but understand how that is actually driving the behavior of the animal and how the behavior of the animal actually feeds back to give it different visual stimuli in the next time around and so on. So again, I think taking a robotic perspective kind of really forces you into having to make that consideration. You build the thing and it acts in the world, something happens to it, and you have to close the loop. And finally, I think um, the other interesting thing I find about it is that you do have to 
just specify. If you're going to build the mechanism, you can't say, here's a black box that does this part of the job, and the rest of my theory will work as long as that black box works. You have to put something in the black box. Um, biologists don't always like this, because often you're speculating wildly, because you don't know. But I think you can learn a lot by making those mistakes and actually building the thing and trying to see you know, what works and what doesn't work. So in other words, I think it, it complements a lot of other approaches in biology. But of course, we've still got a long way to go. So I'd just like to finish um, by thanking lots of people, and I don't want to make it an Oscars speech, but just very quickly. Um, of course, my parents, who kind of always encourage me in, in my endeavors, and my family, and my husband, who's also here. Um, the people who supervised me in Sydney, who really convinced me that an academic career is something I would like to do. Um, the people who supervised me in Edinburgh. Colleagues, of course, that I've, I've worked with in, in the different departments that I've been in. Um, inspiring research assistants and PhD students and project students, and I hope I've mentioned them appropriately as I've gone along in some of the examples. Um, technicians who have done a lot of the work, none of this would have been possible without, and in particular, Rob McGregor, um, who's built a lot of these robot systems that you see here, and various scientific collaborators as well. So I'll finish there. So Barbara, you chose crickets because you wanted uh, simple motion uh, controlled by simple feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so why, when you after you went a bit, didn't you say, "My God, I need to switch to amoeba"? Because now you're, you stop, you, you know, you, because the talk doesn't justify the motivation. The talk says <laughs> that crickets are very, very complicated. They're, you know, yep. they're as sophisticated um, as rats. They, you know, they have motions that are more demand that, that, that are beyond humans. You know. mm -hmm. So why, so why didn't you back off from the crickets and go to go to something? Or slugs. <laughs> Maybe slugs would be easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, they all have their own problems. I think that's, that's it. So as soon as an animal is complicated enough to do something interesting, mm -hmm. it's actually probably too complicated for us to really understand it. So I'm probably just too far down the road with, with crickets mm -hmm. uh -huh. now to, <laughs> to go back. And, and I also feel like, I mean, it feels like a manageable problem. So a cricket brain is very small. It has about 100,000 neurons, maybe mm -hmm. 200,000. And if you think about it, that's actually the size of brain that would fit within, um, when you see those brain scans that show those pretty pictures of human brains and the colors and you know, here's where the activity is, one pixel within those brain scans, an entire cricket brain would fit within one pixel. Okay. So it's not very big, so we should be able to copy it. We should be able to understand what that brain is doing in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, that was an absolutely wonderful lecture, and I'll now call upon Pro Professor Dave Robertson, um, head of the School of Informatics, to propose a vote of thanks. One of the things that you put so much emphasis on in your talk, which is it was very important to us, I think, in informatics, mm -hmm. is, is all of those publications and journals that are in, in biology. And I think it's, it's, the, the serious bit of it all is, is, is how much this kind of work is maturing and starting to feed back mm -hmm. into what we thought of as the traditional uh, sciences. Uh, and for the, for the health of informatics, I think that's, that's incredibly important and, 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 and very good, especially in, in, in this university where there's so much opportunity. So, so it's, uh, it's uh, very, very uh, welcome. Um, uh, the, the other thing that, that's maybe worth, worth saying uh, well, while I'm doing a vote of thanks, so that you haven't talked about because it it's not the subject, actually, but people, people should be aware is there's you know, different ways of getting a chair uh, uh, in informatics and anywhere else. And one is by kind of just sticking to your, to your research and beating everybody else off and all of this kind of stuff. And the other one is where you're doing a lot of stuff on teaching and outreach and, uh, and so on as well. Uh, I think people should be, uh, be aware, if they aren't aware already, of, of, the, of, of the great work that you've done there, too. Uh, you know, holding up things uh, in the school, the graduate school, uh, and, uh, and in the outreach that, that you've done. And so you should be proud of that as well as the, as the research result, the result. And I'm sure we are all uh, of you. Uh, so, uh, so thanks very much, uh, Barbara. Thanks uh, uh, from all of us and for ev everybody else. There's uh, there's drinks outside, and if I can't resist this, uh, if you enjoyed the robot cricket, then come along for some of the other videos from Sethu and Ram on our robot soccer uh, later later on in the, in the year. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. This production is copyright the University of Edinburgh.